Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David, <coughs> David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. Doing Fantastic. Pretty uh, exciting game. Oilers win 7-2 to two over the capitals of Washington, Bruce. And... Mm. Um, let me just get the grade A shot information here for people who are uh, tuned in for that info. It was 20 to 10 for the or 20 to 12 for the orders in terms of grade A shots. Um, Washington had a flurry of them right at the end of the game. They had uh, yeah, one, two, they three, just kept pouring it on. Five, <laughs> at least five really good chances to score in the last six minutes. So um, not not many before then, although there was some. Uh, Edmonton, so 20 to 12 for grade A shots. The subset of five alarm shots were 10 to 7 for the Oilers. So even closer there. But um, it was a fairly commanding performance by the Oilers. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast with one conundrum. And I have a conundrum question. Uh, which I haven't told you yet, so you're going to be on the fly on that. What's your good thing? Yeah, uh, well, I was actually at the game tonight. Uh, was uh, uh, um, my third live game of the year, and my first in the lower bowl, so I really got the chance to enjoy the speed of the game. My goodness, Connor McDavid uh, on the power play when he winds up from his own end and they feed the puck back to him. <sighs> He just flies out there. Anyway, uh, my good thing is the fans of the Edmonton Oilers, my hat is off to you. Uh, all of you threw hats on the ice tonight uh, for the just absolutely fantastic reaction to Connor Brown finally finding the score sheet with his first goal uh, as an Edmonton Oiler in game 64 in the season. I've read lots of vitriol about Brown and Brown's contract and and uh, and so on. And yet, you know, I'm watching the guy play and he's just getting better and better. Like his skating, I think, is finally coming around. And he was stealing pucks tonight off of people. And, and uh, he had uh, uh, a terrific couple of shifts. Uh, and then finally, um, he breaks in with Evander Kane and Kane lobs Blobs went over and credit to Vander Kane. He would normally shoot in that situation, which he should with his heavy shot. But in this case, he just was trying to play the setup man, and he did. And it, it uh, took a, I think it just bounced in off his skate, did it? It did bounce off yeah. his trailing skate, actually. Uh -huh. And for a, even watching the game um, on TV where you have the video replay, it took a while to find the right replay. I was. I was so worried that it wouldn't be Brown who scored that it would hit the D in the end. It would go in off the D men, but it definitely was Connor Brown who yeah. put it in. Yeah. Well, we saw the goal uh, scored from, uh, you know, the puck sort of disappeared into Brown. And I thought Kemper had it, and it was going to be just another one near yeah. miss number three hundred and twenty-six. You know, and instead, it, the puck shows up on the other side over the goal line and in the net. And I literally jumped out of my seat with my hands in the air like I just scored myself. Just no, I had no idea that was coming. I don't usually do that when Oilers score. And the whole place sort of obviously felt the same way because the ovation was incredible. That was the loudest I've ever heard Rogers place, I think. And certainly the longest ovation, one of the longest ovations I've ever heard. Just went on and on and on and on. And I couldn't start the game up because people were throwing hats, <laughs> one goal hat trick over the, and they kept sort of timing it so that every time they thought they had the ice clear, another hat would come over and the ovation just kept going. It had to be five minutes. It was, and, it was unreal. It was unreal. I thought, wow, what a, what a, what a, what a vindication for this guy. Like I had to feel absolutely wonderful for him. He must feel just 10 feet tall being an Edmonton Oiler playing in front of these fans after that performance. What percentage of fans were on their feet, Bruce? hundred percent. I would oh, say. Oh, because I saw within, it. Okay. Within, you know, it, it certainly looked like the whole place was like jumping. All right. And it was, I mean, there, it, I'm sure there was, were places where people didn't get up, you know, for whatever reason, but, uh, 
the guy behind me who left when they made it 6-2 and missed the goal, now he's disappointed. But uh, uh, the, cry, the, the responses went on. The, the impression I got looking around was, was everybody was standing. And, of course, you see the people standing, and you don't see the ones that are seated. I don't remember. Um, there's been some other Edmonton Oilers in recent years who, Tobias Reeder and one other guy who have had struggled. Um, Patrick, uh, Russell. Patrick Russell. And um, I don't remember the same feeling with those players. People were real, I, and I felt it. I was. I've been really pulling for Connor Brown because mm-hmm. I think he's a good player. So do I. Like he makes a lot of the good defensive plays. He's. You can see he's a smart, conscientious defensive player. He just needs to chip in more on the attack. And he'll be, he'll, you know, he can come through for the orders. And the orders need him to come through. Like, they need all these players to come through. They need him to play well in the playoffs. We've, you know, you can see glimpses of, of what this player can be. And um, it was interesting in the interview after the game, he mentioned um, injuries this year. And it sounds, but he said he's feeling great now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can tell. So we know that he was coming off an injury. And we also know he did get banged up. So it sounds like he has been dealing with a few things through the year, but he is feeling good now. And he does look, he he is playing very well now. So um, Bruce, I, I have to, like I had a tear in my eye with mm-hmm. the, in the, with the ovation. It was, yeah. it was very emotional it was. and it was fantastic to see with, it's a small minority of people who are super negative online, but they, they make a big noise online. If you're, if you're online, if you're on mm-hmm. X, Twitter, you know, where there's a huge community of Oiler fans and a lot of discussion. There's a lot of people, there, there's a, a handful of, of fans who make a lot of noise about disliking Connor Brown and, and they wanted him to get bought out. Like, didn't want him to play 10 games so he wouldn't get his bonus. They wanted him sent to them, constantly want him bench. They constantly want him sent to the minors. It's just on and on and on. And um, people are free to be a fan any way they want. Yep. It's okay if they don't like Connor Brown. That, But it, it is not representative. And you Certainly have to, not. like, when, when you're on Twitter, as much as you and I are, because we're on there quite a bit, you can think that's a lot. It's most, like, you know, there might be 30% or 40%. It's not. The, and especially the people who, like, the people who go to the games, especially, are far more forgiving and, and supportive of the players, I think, than um, some of the online fans. They're really invested. They're truly invested. And, and there's a... And... I just think overall in Oilers fandom, it's like 95% who are really invested in Connor Brown and all these players doing well. They want all of the players to do well and they're not, they don't have their knives out for any of them. So that, and that ovation, I think represented that it was a signifier of that, just how much support there is for a player like Connor Brown and, and what, what fans really think of this player and how much they hope for, for all of the players, including Brown. Well, I'm an Oilers fan. I mean, look at my, I'm wearing my Nuge 93 blue tonight for the going to the going to the game. Yeah. And um, uh, my default position has always been I root for all the players. It's not really that hard. Uh, and, you know, that doesn't mean I, I don't take time to analyze and criticize into, you know, what players are bringing to the team and so on. But I, I want them all to succeed. And. This poor guy, I mean, the, the longer this thing has been going on, you could see it weighing on him. And I still think he can help the team in the in the playoffs. And I also still think that uh, putting him with Adam Henrique was a really good move by the coach. He did it already in the second game. And now tonight, uh, Henrique was involved in, the, you know, setting up the goal that he scored. And I just think, you know, being associated with a guy that he had big success with on one specific occasion in the past uh, was... Uh, uh, just a very clever thing for the coach to do, and he uh, he clearly was on it because he did it more or less right away. And uh, who knows? I mean, we got 18 games left. You know, you've we, got a couple more goals now. I wouldn't be surprised to even see three or four. Uh, but the big question is, can he help the team in the playoffs? And watching that guy uh, on the puck like a dog on a bone in the neutral zone. Geez, they come through the neutral zone. He's all over them. And comes away with the puck some of the time, or at least, you know, messes up the rush. And, and uh, that part of his game is just really becoming more and more in evidence as we go. So this is a huge step forward, just getting that gorilla off his back. 
yeah. is, <laughs> is, uh, is a big thing. And like I say, there's a connection with the fans that maybe he hasn't felt before, and he certainly should be feeling it now because that was heartfelt and outstanding. Well done, oil country. Bruce, uh, my good thing is the Oilers' power play tonight. They scored three power play goals, including the first two of the game, which didn't salt the game away because Washington quickly came back. But it did give the Oilers a leg up to start. And um, within 25 seconds on the one power play, Leon Dressel got four one-timer shots, <laughs> three of them on net, three of them five alarm shots, like absolutely deadly shots. And he scored on the last of them. <laughs> that was so. Fun. His dad and mom were in the crowd. They showed um, oh, yeah. uh, on the broadcast. So that was nice to see. Dry do that. Stuff? Yeah, Peter? in front of his parents. So um, then, um, you know, it, it, initially on that four-minute power play to start the game, Washington was shutting them down. But it, as the Washington players got tired, the seams started to open up and the order started to rip them apart. Um, then McDavid went into the slot on a subsequent pow pow power play. And um, if you give him a moment to pick his spot, he will pick his spot. And he certainly did. Like that's for most players, that's not a great a shot where he shot from. But for Connor McDavid, that is he will score 25% um, oh. of the time when you give him time to shoot from that spot. The final goal was um, Dreisaitl put it back to um, Bouchard, who, who I think wristed from not. I don't think he slapped it. I think he wristed a really hard okay. shot at net. It looked like it was right through Hyman's screen, but it turned out it did hit Hyman's leg. And Zach Hyman got a hat trick goal. He's now got, is it 46 on the year? 46 on the you year. You know that Ma Matthews, after everyone looked like he was going to score, like he's really been in a bit of a goal scoring slump. He's only got, he's got 54 now, mm -hmm. I believe. So Hyman's got 46. He's he's still quite a bit a behind him. Mm -hmm. He's a long way back, but he's... Well, um, not as far as before. I mean, yeah. Matthews got to 50 before anyone else had 40. Yeah. And now he's at 54 and Hyman's at 46. Indeed, Bruce. So we'll so. see what happens. We will mm -hmm. see what happens there. Anyway, we'll make it close. Um, we're, and we're not hearing quite as much Austin Matthews for uh, MVP uh, talk as we've heard previously. So that's refreshing. Well, Bruce um, has MVP, right? Yeah, well, oh. he, just because he scores 60 goals doesn't mean he automatically wins the MVP. I'm sorry, Toronto fans. Like, you know, I think I think McKinnon is making a real um, push for the MVP. It'll be McKinnon or McDavid. And I think that's, I'm actually good with either because I have a ton of respect for Nathan McKinnon. I just think he's such a great player. And if he, and if he does win, you know, if he outscores McDavid this year, Colorado outpoints the Oilers. I mean, they're both such crucial players to their team. Uh, but Nathan McKinnon is, he's an yeah. awesome hockey player. He really is. He and McCarr are just such fantastic players. I have a hard time rooting against Colorado because of it. I just, I'm so, I'm, I have so much admiration for those two players. You know, I hope, of course, the Oilers beat them. But um, anyway. They still haven't played. It's their first meeting yeah, of the we got season three on games. Saturday night. Three of the three last games. 18 are against It'll, Colorado, that's a good not barometer. even in our division. Yeah. Yeah, Saturday's game, tonight Colorado came storming back from a 3-0 hole to beat, beat Vancouver in overtime. Sweet. Only thing wrong with that is that it took them till overtime, so Vancouver yeah. got, a, got a point. But Colorado outshot Vancouver 17-3 in the third period. So they clearly must have the, just taken over that hockey game. The Canucks are missing Demko for a couple of weeks at least. So, um, Bruce, uh, there's one other point I wanted to make about the power play. Mc, um, mm -hmm. McTavish was on orders now and uh, Craig McTavish, and he made an interesting point about Bouchard getting his one-timer. Mm -hmm. And he, he like, we, we've speculated why do Mc, Drysdale and McDavid not do a better job setting him up. McTavish has mentioned quickly, like, dr he expects Drysdale will kind of flatten out his pass. What I think he means by that is that Drysaddle will be up higher making the pass. It'll be more of a pass across the ice instead of a pass right, straight back. from the corner. Now, the, the pass that he scored on was um, a wrist shot from the corner. But I think it's kind of hard to one-timer a slap shot from if the pass is coming from the corner. It is probably easier to, to, to get the timing right on a slap shot if it's more of a side pass. So the problem with the 
like McTavish is right. That would work better. The problem is for dry settle to be in his scoring spot. He has got to be down low. So it's kind of a, I think we now have figured out why, what, what, what the problem is. The ideal pass for Bouchard's one timer would be kind of a side pass, but he's not going to get yeah. that from dry settle because dry settle has to be down low. So for, for Bouchard to get that one timer, He's almost got to be on the other side of the ice on the left boards with McDavid coming down the middle of the ice and then as an option, making a side pass to Bouchard. That That's how he'll get off more easily one-timer shots. And I think that's a play that they could work a little bit more. I don't think it's actually going to be Drysaddle who will make that pass because, again, you need him in that. You need him in the, in the zone there, ready to un- unleash the executioner shot. No. Well, anyway, I uh, have, to, have to correct you here. It was a soft shot tonight, uh, which is what I remembered it as. And oh, it was it. I it. fed it from the corner, and Bush was just above the top of the circle and got a full, full clapper on it. And, uh, oh, okay. It I don't, tickled, yeah. tickled the time and somehow did hammer it. By, and it took away an assist from McDavid, that uh, scoring change, so... Double-edged sword a little bit, but I, uh, was about not whatever. Actually so, so that leads into my bad thing. We're only doing one of each, and there was way more yeah. good things and bad things. But my bad thing was that goal of Hyman uh, wasn't credited until there was like a minute and 43 seconds left in the game, I think it was, and they announced that the scoring change. And my bad thing is uh, my how bad I felt for the Washington Capitals players. Down 7-2, to two, they've already had this one sort of long delay as they've been, you know, humiliated by giving up this guy's first goal of the season to make it 7-2. They can't get out there fast enough, out of there fast enough. Uh, and then with a minute and 40 to go, they announced... Hyman scored a hat trick and the hats are coming over the glass again. And again, it was the sequencing where they, you know, the, the guys would do their skate around the ice and then the hats would come after they left. So they'd have to go back after them. It wasn't like they could do one loop and get them all. And it went on for another few minutes. And pe- people were in a very jubilant mood tonight, I have to say. And it was fun. But I did kind of feel bad for Washington at that point, you know, like. Like talk about adding insult to injury, and they uh, they just had to wait it out, and uh, they just wanted to hit the showers and the tarmac. <laughs> Bruce, um, my bad thing, and and I hate, almost hate to bring this up, and it's it's a small thing because it was his Troy Stetcher's first game, and he he did, he didn't have a good game. Um, he took a penalty, and on Two the first. Penalties. Two penalties on the first goal against. I think he was screening. We never did get a really good replay of it, but it looked to me oh. like he, he was... batted the puck into the corner, and then the guy shot it from a really bad yeah. angle. Yeah, it was on and the I think he was screening. Me. I think he was screening Skinner pretty effectively. Skinner probably should have had it anyway, but it's it's um seeing eye shot. That's not a good moment. You're, I think it might have been his first shift even, like because there was those power plays. I don't know if he got out there before then. But he, yeah, right away. And um, he came out of the penalty box once, and he was also um, a culprit on one of... Ovechkin had, oh, there's Cat Stevens. Uh, Bruce's cat has made an appearance. Um, there was three unbelievable shots by Ovechkin that Skinner got, and one of them was after Stetcher's penalty, and he failed to cut out the cross scene pass to Ovechkin. And uh, that was one of them. So it wasn't, it was not an auspicious debut for Troy Stetcher. Um, but I'm sure uh, he'll have better days with the Oilers. And uh, go ahead. Saw some good things. He can wheel. And one of the scouting reports that I read was that somebody wrote, they said that he will get to the first touch on the puck on a shoot in by the other team. And no matter what it takes, whether you get, you know, no matter what kind of physical pressure he's on, and there was a play just like the buddy described. Uh, I think this was a guy in Arizona, uh, Schmaltz's brother, that talked about that. And there was a play just like that where there was a puck, and he went in there and he just paid the price to reach out and t- get a piece of the puck and chip it away from the far checker, and the guy just crushed him. And 
whatever. I took the hit to make the play. And uh, he does have nice wheels, and, and he's he's pretty good on the retrievals, I thought, and on some, some nice first pass. There was one play, Jesus could have been my bad thing, David, uh, where Stetcher made about a 50-foot lead pass to, of all people, his partner, Cody Cece, mm-hmm. outside the blue line, and because everybody was up ice while uh, Stetcher was uh, was loading up. And then Cece took the pass, and he's got the puck in the in neutral zone. And what does he do with it? He retreats back over his own blue line. And then he gets checked. And loses the puck. And that's bringing the puck into your own zone is a no-no for me. I mean, if you do it, you better be safe with it. And it just went sideways. And it wound up being, you know, Stetcher sort of in trouble as that play went, went, went to hell. But it wasn't his fault, you know. Bruce, what's your number? Yeah, my number is 10. And that is the number of consecutive games, home games, that Zach Hyman scored a goal. And with that, he has tied a franchise record held by none other than Wayne Gretzky. And Wayne Gretzky's franchise records don't usually get approached, let alone tied. And he'll have a chance to break it on Saturday. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I haven't had a chance to go through hockey reference to see what year it was that Wayne did. It probably They probably have the dates on one of the stat sites, but... I just heard that he tied uh, the Great Ones franchise record, 10 home games in a row. Yeah, that sounds like something he would do. And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, I know in uh, 80, 81 when he got the 50 and 39, I think he scored in nine straight home games. Anyway, he got, he was, uh, 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 he was routinely putting up streaks of various lengths and types and, so it's not surprising at all that he has a club record. Uh, the the master who has the club record for goals in consecutive games, home or away, is none other than the immortal Dave Lumley, who scored in 12 consecutive games in 1981-82, playing on Gretzky's wing. He was and a good player, he was Dave one Lumley. Short, he was one short of Charlie Simmers' all-time record, 13 games in a row that Simmers set up with the triple crown line. And, in Los Angeles around that same time. It's a year or two before Lumley's run, I think. Dave Lumley, the poor man's Corey Perry. He's, <laughs> he's the poor man's Corey Perry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hyman's just finding ways to score. He, he really sniped a great shot on that second. Oh, the second one was, I had a great a view. I was looking right along the line of sight of that. And it looked like, he had no angle because he had to shoot from right wing and as Robbie Brown put it across his body and across the goalie's body to pick the far corner and hit the post and went right across and it just bulged the net on the other side. And that was, he, you know, he couldn't have hit much more posts without it not going in, right? Was, he just uh, caught it perfect. And, seeing with his stick, seeing mm-hmm. with his stick because that side was open. There was one replay was. that showed it was quite open actually. Yeah, and, well, he buried um, it. And he, he served. Great did. play, great play by Nuge there too. Bruce, my number is three. And there was only three players in that game on the Oilers younger than Connor McDavid. He's the f- he was the fourth youngest Edmonton Oilers player on the ice, which yeah. I found astonishing. Mm-hmm. Um, McLeod is 20. Well, this is Hockey DB. Their, their uh, dates of birth can be a little bit off because they don't update them during the year, I think. Um, we got, um, McLeod, I think he's 24 now, Bouchard, 24 now, McDavid, 27 and Skinner, um, 25. They were the only, only three Oilers younger than McDavid. And then the next youngest guy after McDavid, excuse me, the next oldest guy is Dreisaitl. So he's also, was also one of the youngest players on the ice. So it's a very, very veteran team now. And you know what, Bruce, they're starting to play like a veteran team. We'll see how it's, you know, if it works out in the uh, playoffs for the Oilers, it's genius, right, to have this old veteran mm-hmm. team. But just right now, the way I see it, it, they play smarter hockey than the Oilers have ever played before. They really do. And we've seen it in the streak where they, you know, the two-month streak where they played really solid defensive hockey. 
um, they have a lot more composure and game than they've ever had in the past. Their gamesmanship is way better. So, um, you know, we'll see how it plays out in the playoffs. Will they be fast enough? Will some of these old bodies start breaking down? That kind of thing. But it's not looking that like that bad a bet right now. And and I know some people have scoffed at Ken Holland for kind of building a team that would win 20 years ago in today's younger, faster NHL. But um, we'll see. We'll see, Bruce. Um, it's the oldest roster or the second oldest, one of the oldest rosters in the NHL. Second oldest and, in the league, I heard. After the yeah. Deadline. And um, depending on the night, of course, like who's in the who's in the lineup. So, um, and I think oh. I'd be surprised if we don't see Holloway back on the team for the playoffs. I think they're going to need his speed and energy at some point in the playoffs. But this is an old team, and uh, when McDavid's one of the kids, because he's no kid anymore. He's oh, a that's right, he's twenty-seven year old. Yeah, veteran, right? Indeed. So he's even if he started at eighteen, he's you know. Nine years later, right? And we've got um, a Fogel a few months younger than Drysaddle. I just checked, but yeah, they're the they're the next layer of the class of 2014. And the only like they haven't brought in any young players from outside, really at all. It's only their own draft picks. And right now, the Oilers have exactly zero entry level contracts on the big club. Not a single player on an ELC. That's uh, on the team right now. Of course, I got Broberg and Holloway burning it up down in uh, Bakersfield, but there they remain. You're right. Hockey DB has dry settled is younger on my list here, but actually Fogel is uh, six yeah, months younger. Same, right. Yeah, if All right. you can sort it by birth date rather than age, because I've got a oh, call out for that. That's, that, 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 that's infallible when you do it that way. There we go. Bruce, yeah. the conundrum tonight. Will Alexander Ovechkin catch Wayne Gretzky? <laughs> Will Alex? And I'm going to say no. Okay. I'm going to say no, partly because I don't want him to. So this oh. is motivated reasoning on my part. But he's got he's uh, 54 goals behind. He's got what is it? 18 goals this year. Yeah, that's it's three the first whole year. years at that rate. It's the first year that he's fallen off scoring like that. So. It's a it's a rather market. He's he's um what is he now thirty seven? Um, it's a rather market drop in scoring to eighteen goals. This is a bad team. The he's Capitals thirty eight. Thirty eight. They're not getting any better. Um, they're not going to get any better. They're going to get worse. Mm-hmm. They don't have any. They don't have a lot of offensive talent coming up in this system. I mean, I don't know. How, He's, you know, it's it's going to be hard for him to get his chances because he's. You know, so so the one thing that could change his fate is is if he becomes fanatically devoted to changing his game somewhat. I think he's got to probably lose some weight, get a little faster, quicker, speed up. Um, but I don't think he's going to do it. I I think um, that's a lot to make up when you're getting 20 goals a year. So, yeah. And he, can he still get 20 a year? Like, yeah, well, he had 42 last year and 50 the year before that. And basically 50 every year before that for a lot of years, you know, 49, 48, and I think nine seasons of 50 plus. Uh, But 18 is far, far off his, his, um, uh, his general average. He's got 31 assists this year, which isn't too bad. Yeah, uh, but he, they're not going in for him. And man, tonight he'll be seeing Stuart Skinner in his nightmares. He was robbed by Skinner several times. Skinner's first save of the game after the first two shots went in, where it came flopping across the goal crease and kept one out. Uh, that was uh, off of a Vetchkin, I'm pretty sure. And I do know for sure that it, like, Ovi had a couple of chances right from the low slot, right in front. And one glove grab that Skinner made in the late going, that drew a partial standing ovation as well, because it was, it was. And the guy on my row that had the number eight Capitals jersey on, that was the moment that he got up and left. <laughs> you know, he hardly missed a game, Bruce, mm-hmm. in the first. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a horse. Until about 19, 
or till about 2018, 19. Yeah. He hardly missed a game. And then he started to miss a few games, like mm-hmm. three games. And then what was it? Uh, nine, yeah. five, nine. So he's starting to, he's starting to miss a few more games. The scoring really dropped off a cliff. Now players can rebound from one bad year, yeah. right? They can, they can decide, Oh, yeah. I'm going to change my training. I'm going to, go I'm going to change my it. approach. I'm going to change my diet. Got to, I'm going to, got to do to everything I can. Of, that's right. So depending on his motivation, like if he really wants it mm-hmm. and is determined to get it, he could he could do those things and, and pro- maybe find a way to do it. Get hot scoring one year. Like, you know, one 35-goal year, one more big year, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll take close enough to, yeah. to make it happen because he's, what is it? Gretzky has, it's 54 goals. To yeah. 840. So he's within striking distance. And it looked like he was going to do it yeah. last year, like heading into this year. It was mm-hmm. the, looked like a certainty, right? Because he was just going yes. so strong. Yeah. But I'm starting to. Have you done well, thing? I, I have. I got my fingers crossed that he doesn't do it. So again, I'm engaged in a motivated reasoning here, but I'm going to say no. Right. Yeah. Well, he certainly got, he had seven shots on net tonight. And I. I was constantly flummoxed at how wide open he was on the power play. Like he'd be standing over there on the Ovi spot and the puck would be on the near boards and all four orders would be on the near boards. And if Washington got it, it was one pass and a one timer. And that happened a few times. And he also snuck into other positions to shoot. Uh, but it's like, teams say, well, we fight them four on four and we try and check them that they can't get them the puck. You know, because they treat him like he's not out there, and then to sit, then it's even, right? Four on four, and oh, he's standing. You know, he's on an island. Uh, uh, but watching live, like I, I was just surprised. Sometimes it'd be 40, 50 feet from any opponent. And yeah, well, he was shooting from distance when he did shoot, though, Bruce. Like he never, and maybe he's always shot from a bit more distance than other players and been successful that way. But mm-hmm. they were he, like his one really good one timer was pretty. It was fairly far out. Like it was, it was the high, right at the top of the circle. Yeah. Oh and yeah. No, he's a long so, way up there. That's yeah. his spot. He, he shoots from there. Yeah. Maybe but, he doesn't uh, have tonight. He own, shot but... tonight. He shot from right in front two or three times as well, where he yeah. kind of snuck in and got the back door play, and, and uh, Skinner just kept getting the better of him. But um, he is. Uh, he had three that were blocked tonight and one that missed the net. And it was an absolute rocket that that slammed off the glass in the third period. It went over the, over the net. Yeah. And it sounded like Reed Larson shot hitting the glass, you know. at the. <laughs> to be very fair to Ovechkin, too, in this whole thing, if you, if you include score effects, right, like how difficult no. it was to score in the league at the time when the player was there, yeah. I mean, he he is, he would be number one. Because it was a quite a bit easier to score in the '80s. Of course, Gretzky distorted the '80s in his own way by making it. Everyone had to play catch up to the Oilers. You had to score because they were just going to outscore you. So it made the whole league more attacking, I believe. So there, you know, so you could make that argument that in terms of Gretzky being the greatest goal scorer. But if you do make look at score effects, I think that it it starts to get a little tighter and maybe Ovechkin. Um, uh, it's close to being equal already with Gretzky. So, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, some people call them error effects, and it's yeah. certainly a, uh, error uh, effects. That's a better he's word. He's won. He's run the Rocket Richard Trophy seven, eight, nine times. Yeah, nobody, nobody's come close to that. You know, like his his. See, there you go. He, he's being being the best in the league and maintaining it over many many years. Like a very strong case couldn't be made. Uh, just you know, if you if if you just plot his score against the goals that are being scored in his era, so he's got um, uh, he's finally finally age thirty eight finally starting to show a little bit of sign of wear and tear. He's the oldest of um, he's older than you think in the sense that he was drafted in two thousand and four, and he was. Among the very, very oldest people in his draft class, his birthday was seven, September 17th, 85. So if he'd been born two days earlier, he would have gone in the 03 draft. So he goes in the 04 draft. And of course, 04, 05, they don't play any hockey that entire season. 
So the next year, year he turns 20 in, in training camp and he's never missed a game in the NHL, you know, that he was eligible for. And yet he's already 20 before he even plays his first game. They both, like Gretzky had, was kind of robbed of a year of his scoring too because they don't count his first year as a pro player in the WHA and his official scoring. Mm-hmm. So, and, and both of them missed time because of strikes. Gretzky missed, one season was truncated and Ovechkin missed the whole season and then an, a part of another. So, and then there's COVID that, that cut out yep. some time for him. So it's always, yep. all these things play into it. But uh, mm-hmm. you know what, if he does beat Gretzky, Good for him. He's a fantastic hockey player, and I won't begrudge mm-hmm. him that. I just, I mean, I just, I still hope for Wayne. I, I got what I wanted to see. I wanted to see Ovi play. I didn't want to see him score, but I wanted to see him shoot, and I wanted to see Stu Skinner stop him. There you and go. All of those things happened tonight repeatedly. Should be very happy tonight. <laughs> Bruce, let's leave it there. Saturday night, Colorado. We'll talk then. Well, let's thanks hope for we're smiling then. Thanks for talking tonight. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.